Well, it's good to be back to uh, Kansas State University. Uh, I can't believe it's been 19 years when my wife and I rolled into town in August. Um, if you're old enough, you remember the Bob Newhart show, and it's like we woke up at the end of the last episode and we're back in Kansas, and it's kind of like, wow, 19 years in North Carolina, and then we came back here. So we're, we're really excited to be back here. Um, I'm really excited uh, about the opportunities we have here with the new feed mill, and when they approach me about this job, uh, I'll have to admit, um, having this new $16 million toy at my disposal was pretty intriguing. But the second part was the opportunity to work with the swine group. They've been after me for years, so let's do some collaborative research. And um, I think uh, Tokash was on the phone. It seemed like every uh, day calling me and saying, hey, are you going to apply? Are you coming here? So um, I, it's good to be back here. And I can see I already made my first mistake. I was so concerned about getting animal science first up on the billing, I actually put the wrong um, email address up there. You can take off the NC and just put that as <laughs> K. <laughs> So, but you can still reach me at that one, but I was so focused on animal science being up there that I messed up there. So, you know, um, uh, Dr. Jones will uh, let me know about that later because uh, the biggest thing was trying to get my wardrobe from red to purple. I'm, I'm doing on that. So, slowly but surely. So, anyhow, we're going to talk about feed manufacturing, and I'm going to talk about uh, some of the proposed rules that's coming out with the new uh, Feed Safety uh, Modernization Act ingredient feed quality, particle size reduction, and batching and mixing is some of the, the key things I want to go through here in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Now, uh, these are proposed rules. So when you see a, a proposed rule doesn't mean it's the final rule. There's a 120-day comment which will probably be extended beyond that. But these are the rules that FDA is going to lay out for the feed industry. It used to be primarily those people using Medicaid feed had these GMPs. Now we're going to see this rolled out across the whole feed system. So these are off the FDA website, so this is what they're thinking. Uh, this is from uh, 21 CFR Part 507. If you're really interested in reading the document, it's only 405 pages, the best novel you've ever thought about. It, it's on my desk, so uh, I've got about 100 of it. Uh, so this is about current good manufacturing practices and hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls for animal feeds. That's a fancy way for FDA saying, go look in your feed mill, find the problem, and then figure out how you're going to prevent that problem from getting out and harming animals. So that's kind of the overlying um, gist of what they're trying to do. So this was um, a summary of the requirements. It's established for the first time good manufacturing practices for animal food. And along with that, you're going to have to go through and do a risk analysis and then come up with preventive controls. Well, that sounds like it can be very complicated, but if you just think about it in a feed mill, if you're grinding, if you have a magnet inside any place in your feed mill, you're pulling out metals. Well, metals are a risk, and you put a preventive control in, you put in a magnet. Check one off your list. So there are some simple things we're already doing that this uh, law is going to just push us to evaluate every part of the operation. So um, these are what they're saying are qualified facilities um, who would fall under this rule. If you are less than um, half a million um, dollars, um, less than a million or less than 2.0 million annual sales, then there'll be different phases in as far as when you uh, have to uh, go into these regulations and there'll be a, a phase in based on those time frames. So and when it's all said and done, um, if you are doing less than a half million per year um, during the last three years, you probably have a, about a three year time frame to uh, work on this. Okay, now there are gonna be some exemptions. So if you're feeding your own animals, there's some farm exemptions in here they're proposing. Um, activities within defined farm include farm activities that are covered by the proposed Rule, low risk manufacturing, such as if you're just handling grain going in and out, those may be considered some ro low risk. So they are going to have some exemptions in there uh, depending on where you fall, but I just wanted to point that out. So these are some of the things that we're going to be looking at in the, the new rule. The personnel, the plant, the grounds, uh, sanitation, sanitation facilities, um, process controls, equipment, 
warehousing and distribution. So these are some of the items we're going to have to work on as we move forward. And a lot of these are very basic, like um, Dr. Henry is talking about, uh, doing the basics will get you a long ways. And so a lot of these rules are just uh, common sense, good manufacturing, good business practices in my mind. The one thing that's going to come up is when we develop this plan, you have to have a qualified person. We really don't know what FDA means when they say a qualified person, um, but it's going to have to be someone that understands how a feed mill works, how to identify hazards, and then come up with a plan in order to avoid or, in their words, minimize those hazards. So uh, we're going to have to have a qualified person work on, on that one. And so in their definition for what a qualified individual looks like, it must have successfully completed a training in the development and application of risk-based preventive controls, which um, sounds like a HACCP program or someone's been through HACCP, or at least equivalent to the rec or received or to that received under a standard curriculum recognized or adequate by FDA, or um, the one on the bottom probably is where I fall on. Be otherwise qualified through job experience to develop and apply a food safety system. So um, hopefully my uh, few years in the industry will help me uh, be a qualified person. But I don't know yet. I'll let FDA decide whether I'm a qualified person or not. So if we look at this in just in a, a quick nutshell here, what FDA is proposing is that we go through and we identify those hazards in your operation. We put in place a preventive controls. We monitor those um, procedures. So if, in my example, for instance, a magnet, how often are you going out and looking to see if you have metal on that magnet and clean it? Um, if you are getting metal through your system, what are your corrective actions? And then how do you verify and keep records on everything that you're doing? So in my book, we're going to probably spend a lot more time doing record keeping and documentation of what you're already doing. A lot of these things, when you're looking at the regulations, we're already doing them. We just don't write them down every day and say, hey, we went out and we uh, checked that piece of equipment. So I think a lot of that is going to come back in here. But we will see as these rules start um, coming out. And then uh, the thing that's interesting, when we look at the food regulations and the feed regulations, one of the things that I found was very interesting is that nutritional controls are going to be a hazard. So what they're saying is on the human side, um, you know, you don't have to eat a well-balanced meal, but on the animal side, you have to be providing nutrients to those animals in a well-balanced um, formula. So they're going to actually go and look at, are you producing or manufacturing feed that meets the nutrient requirements of the animal? So that's something that's different from the, uh, from the food side. Uh, sanitation controls, and then um, every facility will have to have some type of recall plan. What are you going to do in the unlikely event that you have to go through a recall? What's your steps in order to do that recall within your facility? So those are some of the preventive controls that we're going to be looking at over the next few years. So with that all said, that was my public service announcement on FISMA. Um, just as this uh, starts rolling out over the next uh, several years, we'll be having um, workshops, seminars, FDA will be having seminars on how to develop these programs. And um, if you want to talk about this uh, more, feel free to contact me or Dr. Jones, and we'll be glad to, to help you uh, through, that, through that process. Okay, so I want to talk about quality assurance, and to me, um, it all starts with having a good quality assurance program. And that's what you're going to see a lot with these, uh, these FISMA regulations, is you have to have a good quality assurance program as your base foundation for whatever you're going to do. And so for me, developing a quality assurance program involves all of these factors up here. Uh, job descriptions for your employees, having a quality team, setting up specifications for what you're going to purchase, uh, and then covering all the areas within the feed manufacturing process. You can see I have here the process, a sampling of finished feed, feed shipment, sanitation, pest control, uh, investigations, recalls, reports, and then those critical control points. So those are all things that are going to be in our quality assurance program. 
So if you have a good solid quality assurance program, this will get you probably 80, 90 percent of where you need to be in order to meet a lot of these regulations. If you don't have a good quality assurance program, I would suggest now is a good time to start because that's a prerequisite program that will be the foundation for whatever you're doing. And uh, there's some out there that you can uh, purchase and start helping you develop those throughout your system. Some other things from a quality assurance uh, program, some of the things that are coming online for new technology, Jim wanted me to talk about some of the new technologies out there. NIR is probably one of the uh, more exciting things that I see coming in uh, the area of feed manufacturing. Now I've been working with NIR for the last 20 plus years, but some of the new online technology, the fact that you can take a sample out of the, um, out of the feed mill at the end of the process, stick it in this container, close the lid, and it will tell you things like moisture, protein, fat, starch, amino acids, some of these things makes it very intriguing. When I started out, we had to take, grind a little sample down through a real fine screen, pack a cell, do it, and then put it into the machine and make sure everything is right. Now you basically grab a sample, throw it in the machine, and they can give you these answers very quickly. So it allows you to actually start fine tuning your rations as you go through the process. Some of the other interesting things, when we start talking about, well, what can we do pushing the envelope in the feed manufacturing world? Here um, are some suggestions that Bruker have come up with where they could actually apply inline NIR technology. What do you think about actually putting an NIR inline and measuring particle size on the fly all the time? So the NIR is always giving you feedback. So when your roller mill or hammer mill isn't working properly, it uh, throws up a red flag and says you have to go out there and adjust it. These are some of the things that they're talking about are potential. In the batching operation, imagine taking an NIR, putting it into your soybean meal bin and readjusting your formulation based on the protein content or amino acid content of what's coming through the bins, probably on protein content. But when they came to me and started talking, they said, well, what happens if we adjusted uh, every batch of feed based on what's coming out of there? I said, well, you know, that could almost be a nightmare from a standpoint of trying to figure out what's going in and out of the formulas. But in their proposal, they believe they can do that. They can take that information, do a least cost formulation, and kick that back out and give you a brand new least cost formulation based on what's coming out of your uh, ingredient bins. That's pretty spectacular in my mind. And then on the batching and mixing, imagine putting all your ingredients in the mixer and it mixes until it gives you a uniform distribution and then it discharges. So it knows what the moisture protein fat content is and when it says it's mixed, it drops it out. And then same thing as we go through pelleting and loadout, measuring moisture, protein, all those as we go along. And it's very simple, well, it's, it's simple in my mind. You basically take and you uh, mount a probe someplace in a stream where a product is going across it. It sends that back to the computer. The computer takes that information, downloads it into a database, and then you can manipulate it and use it however works best in your system. And so we have just two different types. Um, this was a Bruker. The one before that was their, the Foss. Uh, just two companies that make um, NIR machines out there uh, available. For me, one idea I had is just imagine if you're receiving in DDGs and the computer would automatically know which bin to put that in. So as you're loading DDGs and then it decides, okay, I have DDG the 4% up to 8% fat, the computer automatically knows where that goes in your system by scanning the inbound product and then diverting it into the bins automatically. Don't have to make the decision. Uh, the truck just shows up and it will start separating and segregating bins out there for you. So lots of uh, nice new tools that we have coming in the, in the future. The other thing is for anyone that's doing pelleting, um, understanding moisture control. Uh, moisture control into the mixer, which I can then use to improve my conditioning uh, process, which improves my pellet quality. And then actually going through the pelleting process and coming out of the end of the cooler, then I can measure the moisture content. Because typically what I found in the industry was when my moisture content in my feed started going up because I wasn't doing a good job of cooling, I can see that in my feed conversions because I'm feeding more water and less nutrients and I can actually see that coming up. 
Um, in North Carolina, where I was at, usually December, January, the broiler people would be knocking on my door because moisture content was going on up in the feed, and the same was feed conversion was. So they could actually pick that up in the birds. The moisture content difference in the feed was driving feed conversion in broilers. That, they're that sensitive to moisture content that we could pick that up. So that's where some of the, the quality NIR technology um, capabilities are. So now let's take a look at, at grinding. Um, so everyone's seen this, uh, this slide that um, Bob Goodbam put together. Didn't know that you'd be famous for I use this almost every place I go, Bob. You should be getting royalties off this, I think, or something like that. I know where the data come from. <laughs> so, so what I want you to take away from this as you reduce particle size it improves feed conversion. Now, there's a lot of other factors that go into that uh, herd health, whether it's meal, whether it's pelleted. But for me as a feed manufacturer, what I'm looking at is what can I do to help um, produce more meat, milk, and eggs more efficiently? So I view the feed mill as a tool. And so if someone comes to me and says, I want 400 micron corn, that's my job as a feed manufacturer to figure out how I'm going to get you 500 micron corn or 400 micron corn. I wish it was 400 micron corn. Now if you go to the Carolinas, they're talking about 300 micron corn and try and figure out how to use 300 micron corn. So they, um, once we get to the target, then they keep changing the target on me. That's, uh, that's the challenging uh, thing for me. I think uh, one of our grad students, um, John, was he trying to get 200 microns? Is that right? Yeah. We're trying to get to 200 microns, and that's a little bit tougher. So if we look at roller mills, and I'm going to only talk about roller mills because that's primarily in, the, uh, in this part of the country. We use a lot more roller mills than we do hammer mills and, and going through the pelleting process. So let's just talk about roller mill designs. When you talk to the roller mill people, the two things they say probably have the biggest influence on the grinding process with roller mills is number one, are you mechanically cleaning the corn? Are you removing the rocks and the cobs and the stalks and all those products that are causing issues in the grinding process? And then what's the quality of the corn? You know, tell me what the moisture content, tell me test weight, because those factors probably have the biggest influence of what's coming out after the grinding process, those two up there. Then once you figure out where you're at there, then we can start talking about roll diameter, number of roll pairs. And you can see you can have double pairs, uh, triple pairs, and even quads. Um, when you go out to the feed mill, you're going to see that we have a triple pair roller mill. RMS actually offered us a four high roller mill, but we didn't have room for it. I think we have room for it yet. So, you know, I'm going to try and uh, see if I can uh, talk them into that four high, and we'll figure out how we're going to shove that into the bottom of that uh, feed mill. But I think it'd be nice to have a four pair roller mill. Now, the, the challenge I see as I go around is that with these three or four high roller mills, um, we can get down to um, 350, 400 microns. The challenge is in a mash dye or meal dye, it's very difficult for that to flow through the rest of the system. So if we continue to, we've got the technology in the feed mill, now we need to figure out how we get that to flow through the rest of the system. Because if there's money on the table to being down to around 400 microns, um, should we be taking advantage of that? And so uh, over the next uh, few years, that's one thing I want to look at. What can I do to improve the flowability of that corn? So we may have to actually start fractionating it, but if there's money on the table and it makes us all money, we need to take a look at that. So you can see the, the, the old standard, a lot of two high roller mills out there. Uh, nowadays, most people are going back and installing a three high. Some of the companies have actually got a retrofit kit where you basically raise that up, slide another single pair underneath that, and they have a retrofit so you can take a two high and take it to a three high. They'll tell you it's probably not quite as efficient as going with a brand new one, but it does get you there um, a little bit cheaper. Uh, physically cleaning the corn. Uh, most people have something like this that physically cleans the corn well. It takes out the big rocks, it takes out the stalks, but it doesn't do a very good job as compared to putting in a Rotex uh, cleaner. So if I was going to spend the money to put in one of these pieces of equipment, first thing I would do is buy a good screener so you're feeding 
good clean corn to those roller mills all the time. And that will help you with flowability problems and it will also extend the life of those rolls. So to me, this is the most important thing that we can do in order to help maintain a good grind out in the field. What do we have in our mill? We don't have that. We have this. Well, I take the back. This is standard, but we do have a, uh, a corn cleaner up above, yes. Um, so if you're willing to pay a little bit extra more for your feed, Jim, I'll clean the corn for you. How's that? <laughs> it's all about the money, right? I'd rather have a Rotex than a triple pass. <laughs> if I had to make a choice, I'd probably go with the triple pair because I can do less work on each of those rolls. And so, um, yeah, this will take out most of it, uh, but I can, uh, I can pull that and do uh, less work. But ideally, if you want um, things you know, I think we need to figure out how we can make these a little bit more efficient and retrofit those in. Because the problem I see in most places, they, there's no room for it. No space. There's no space. So um, that's maybe where we need to get the engineer involved and figure out how we can, I have this much space, I need to get this big piece of equipment in that much space and make it work efficiently. Yeah. So um, if someone comes up with that idea, remember you heard it here first. <laughs> Okay, batching size. Um, this is one thing I run into a lot out in the field, and I just want to, how am I doing on time? You're fine. No. Okay. What now? Okay. This is one thing I run in in the field quite a bit, and I just want to point it out, is that when we do least cost formulation, a lot of times we'll put down the percent, and then we'll send out the formula to the feed mill, and you look at the percent, they multiply it up, and this is how much goes into a um, three-ton batch of feed. But then the, the feed mill gets and says, well, you know, my scale breaks in every 10-pound increment. So um, you're either going to get uh, 3830 or 3840. You're never going to get uh, 3834.6. I can guarantee you that. The best scale out there on a major scale is going to probably break on one pound. Uh, but most of them are probably breaking on two pounds. And so when you go start looking down this line here, and it's not as bad on the major ingredients, but you start coming down here and looking at lysine, even breaking on a minor scale, plus or minus two pounds, you're looking for 12 pounds. That's a pretty expensive ingredient uh, to be off by. And if you look at what adds up in your cost, it's just something to be very cognizant of is what the nutritionist is sending to the feed mill. Does it have the capability of actually doing that? Because when I talk to the feed mill people, they say, well, we just round up or down uh, based on the formulation. So to them, the formulation is just kind of a suggestion of what they need to be in because they don't know what to do. What would you do? Would you round up, round down? And so just keep that in mind is if your nutrition is sending out formulations or if you are running a feed mill, um, how close are you? Also talking about some new technology, if we look at what's on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, this is typically what we do in the U.S. We take, we grind our major uh, cereal grains, we put them to a ground corn bin, and then we weigh everything up. If you look at the model for what's coming out of Europe, is they will basically take all their major ingredients, they'll grind them, and then they'll mix them together. And so that has some advantages, especially if you're trying to pellet um, feed and you have a wide variety of ingredients. You can actually mix those ingredients or weigh those ingredients, grind them, and then mix them together. So it gives you a more uniform particle size throughout the system. So if we're looking at where we're going in the U.S., if I was building a new feed mill uh, in the U.S. right now and it had pelleting capability in the future, I would go with this uh, post-batch grind system because it gives me a lot of flexibility. In this system, I have to have one ground corn bin and one whole corn bin. If I'm using wheat, then I have to have one for each of those. And then I also need a grinder. Um, I've been to some feed mills and they're grinding sorghum, wheat, and corn. And so they're barely keeping up because they never have the right amount of any ingredient at any given time. So, as we start looking at more byproducts in the U.S., I think this is a, a nice design. Um, I've been at several mills like that in the, 
EU, and that, that's um, it's a nice way to go. The other thing, if if I look over probably the the biggest advancements we've had in the feed industry in the last uh, ten years, it's been all on the automation side. If you look at a pellet mill um, that we have out of uh, there, it's basically the same design as was used um, 20, 30 years ago. Now we've made some improvements here or there, but the basic design is the same. Mixers have changed a little bit, but where you can get the most bang for your buck is looking at the automation system. Using automation, you'll see this when you go out to the feed mill. Uh, you can see that everything we have in there is 100% automated. So the operator, and I wanted to mention, um, everyone was thanking everyone um, for the work they've done. When you guys go out there, if you go out for the tour today, uh, you need to thank uh, this uh, young man, Joel McAtee. He is our feed mill manager out there. Uh, he makes all this research uh, activity happen on the feed manufacturing side. It's not me. Um, so much so that he was there this Sunday running feed for research, and he's going to be here this Sunday making feed also. Uh, so Joel and his crew out there really make things happen. So what I found in my uh, industry experience was you surround yourself with great people, and they make you look really good. So uh, Joel makes me look really good every day of the, of the week. But what you can do with this automation system is now I can track uh, ingredients, I can collect data, I can look at my inventory. When you go out there and look at this feed mill here, it actually tells you how much is in each of those bins. It knows what's in each of my bins on an inventory basis. So there's a lot of capability as you look at what a computer system will do for you. Probably one of the biggest things I've been involved in in the last two or three years is looking at statistical process control about what's going on in the batching uh, system because this is where you can over um, add ingredients or you can not add enough ingredients and for me as a feed mill person that's just a matter of shrink or gain so it's an economic matter for me for the pigs for the nutritionists um, it comes down to real performance in the field and so what I'm starting to do is go in and um, do S, um, statistical process control. This happens to be, we looked at a, about 50 batches of feed in an automation system, and we found on average we're always adding three pounds of soybean meal extra for every three-ton batch. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, and still you start looking at it on a dollar side, 25 cents a ton additional cost for adding soybean meal. I mean, where I come from in the integrated industry, uh, $25, I mean, 25 cents is a lot of money uh, trying to take it out of the manufacturing side. And here I have a piece of equipment that's automatically just adding extra corn or soy meal in the process. So it's starting to look more at what's going on in that. And then what's great about these new automation systems, you can see this one here, it actually tells me how much I'm under or over on every time I weigh up corn. So I can see where my problems are, I can go back there, I can track down those problems. Now, to correct that, if I'm looking at new technology, what I put into a new feed mill now is a variable frequency drive, a VFD, for each of my screws. And so what that does, it allows me to run that screw conveyor with the ingredient um, close to my target amount. And then the computer goes in there and it tells the motor to slow down and then it just adds in the last amount of material. So it can get right uh, down to that one pound if you want. Um, we have these systems on micro um, scales and we talk about adding the tryptophan. I feel comfortable adding a tenth of a pound of tryptophan in these diets if I'm making at least a, a three to five ton batch because I can slow the system down. It's going to take me some time but I'd feel comfortable at those uh, levels if you're looking at it. So I would invest the money in a VFD on every one of my batching screws. And what um, a lot of companies are doing is they'll just go ahead and have one VFD and they'll run every screw through that VFD so it's not as expensive as it used to be. So if I was spending my money today, um, and the students that have me in class, they hear me talk about VFDs all the time. I think they're the, the uh, greatest invention, and they're getting a lot cheaper now. So I don't think you can have too many VFDs in the feed mill. Mixing. Um, 
From a mixing perspective, this uh, is a very basic, a very simple process. But what I have found in my time in the industry is a lot of times we're looking for this big fix. And it's really about the details of what you're doing day in, day out. Verifying formulas, checking the hand ads are put into the mixer correctly and in the right order. Establishing dry mix and wet mix times. Making sure the mixer is working properly. Um, recording production, doing your drug reconciliation, things as simple as checking your scale every day to make sure that hand ad scale that you're using that's putting your most expensive ingredients into that mixer, is it weighing the same every day or did someone kick it and it's off by a quarter or half a pound and you're over adding ingredients in there. Um, quick story, Jim probably doesn't remember this, but when, a long, long time ago when I was a, uh, doing my final defense for a PhD, when I was getting ready to go out to work for uh, Murphy Farms, Jim's question to me in my PhD was, so Dr. Stark, what are you going to do to make Murphy Farms more money, more profitable? I'm sure I gave him this big elaborate answer about you know, how we can apply new technology and all this. What I learned was it was getting back to the basics. Are we doing these types of things every day because the, the money is looking for the variation and controlling that variation. So uh, as I go through, I still remember that question, Jim, and I always go back and think, well, you know, it sounded good, but in reality, it's looking at those details every day. That's where the money is. And so it gets back to things as simple as a mixer uniformity test. Are you doing mixer uniformity tests? And I believe the, the Swine Science Lab, they do mixer uniformity tests, is that right? So if you have not done a mixer uniformity test, and I recommend uh, doing a mixer uniformity test twice a year, the FDA says you're only required to do it once a year, but to me, this is the heart and soul of what you're doing every day. Don't you want to make sure you're doing a good job of mixing feed? Um, and so get 10 samples from that batch of feed, when it's discharging, send those 10 samples into the lab, talk to the swine group, uh, contact me, and do a mixer uniformity and find out if you have a problem. If you don't have a problem, then you know you're good and you can just uh, rest easily for, for that day. So, and you can sample all kinds of places. You know, traditionally we used to sample the mixer, but that's pretty difficult. You can sample from the surge. To me, the best place is just as it comes out of the um, drag conveyor, out of the mixer, going into your bucket elevator, just pull a sample and get 10 samples throughout that time. Very simple. The other thing that's very important, especially as we start looking at medications or people trying to use paline and paline can't go to the EU or Japan or China, uh, from that standpoint, what type of flushing sequencing procedures do you have in place to make sure we don't have any carryover product. And so you can basically go through, uh, make whatever type of medication um, that you're trying to work with, run a flush through that uh, mixer, all the equipment, and then sample the flush material, send it in, and then uh, go ahead and sample the next batch of feed. And then you have validation as to whether your manufacturing process is working. And it's uh, very easily, but it's just one of those basic things that you have to do in order to make sure you're uh, following the rules and regulations. And then finally, once we get ready to deliver the feed, I believe there's another opportunity in what is costing us to deliver feed. And so as we start looking at different opportunities, um, this is our uh, new feed truck that we just got donated uh, this summer. It was up at uh, World Pork Expo. But there's a lot of things that you can do to actually reduce the amount of weight on those tractor trailer units. And so you're hauling more feed um, instead of hauling less weight around. So you can put on super singles on the, the tires, which uh, with aluminum rims takes more weight off. And instead of having a 32 gallons of hydraulic oil that you're hauling around, you can put a four gallon hydro pack on there. It, looks, it works like a radiator um, for your hydraulic oil, your reduced weight. And at the end of the day, if you are a feed mill and you're hauling 23 ton of feed on a load because that's a legal amount, and I'm out here using a, 
a trailer that's basically stripped down, it's costing you an extra 64 cents a ton to haul that feed to the field. So once again, in my world, you know, I'm not talking about pennies, and here we can do it for 64 uh, cents. The thing that's also is if you're ordering feed and you're not bringing a full load of feed to your feed mill, chances are you're getting haul, uh, charged the same amount for delivering a half a load or a full load out there. And so it can be costing a dollar if you're only hauling 21 tons. And then you start looking at, well, what are you paying per round trip mile? And so there's opportunities in the feed side, especially on delivery. So my take home message for the group is, Feed manufacturing operations must develop processing parameters and quality standards to optimize the production of pork. So for me, uh, my whole career has been about uh, not making money in the selling of feed, but my money comes when I am um, putting that meat either uh, into the processing plant or selling it to the customer. So it's a different mindset. For me, it's about delivering nutrients and delivering the nutrients that are most efficient for the animal. And then management decisions must be based on overall goals and objectives of the business, not one individual cost center. So if you have the feed mill trying to make money and it's at the expense of the purchasing group or the expense of production, then at the end of the day, you're not going to make as much money as if you all work together. Um, so that's the key is understanding what's your goal and making sure the person that's running that mixer understands their paycheck comes from when they sell that animal or when they process that meat. So it's going all the way back into the system. And then always be evaluating what's the best return on investment. And, um, and you know, I used to hate this, the fact that, you know, when I put in a capital project, there was always someone that had a better return on investment. And so it's all about who's going to make the most money when they have a quarter million dollars there. Um, can you make more money in the processing plant or can you make more money in the feed mill? Usually it was the processing plant, unfortunately. But anyhow. So um, this is a, a OH Cruz feed mill. And one thing I put up here, um, Otto Cruz, who is um, the individual that the feed mill is named after, he had four or he had five core values. And um, his son uh, gave a speech at dedication. And this was uh, core value number five, which I really liked. Um, he said, uh, be responsible, be enthusiastic, and have fun. And for me, any day I can spend at a feed mill is a, is a good day. It's a good, fun day. <laughs> Trust me. My students know that. And I actually extended tours um, past 5 o'clock because I get overtime after 5, Jim. So, you know. That's uh, how come you have two bosses. That's why I have two bosses so I can get, you know. So. But we will have feed mill tours um, out there today. When you go out there, um, look for students in um, purple shirts, and they'll be available to give you tours throughout there. Uh, we are going to have some ice cream out there. If you think it's too cold, um, the Feed Safety Research Center here is environmentally controlled. If you want it 80 degrees in there, I can take it up to 80 degrees. Actually, after you all leave, we're going to heat that building to 140 degrees. And we're... What? <laughs> and um, it's a Feed Safety Research Center. It's designed so that we... It's a BSL-2 level, so we can work with pathogens in there and we're going to be testing it whether we can heat it to 140 degrees, hold it for 24 hours, which is a kill step in the process. So after you leave, we're going to uh, create the uh, uh, Caribbean environment down there. Maybe throw some sand down on there, I'm not sure. So with that, um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them.